Um, so hi, I'm joined here today by Ben Andrews, who is just going to be telling us a little bit um, about himself and the company that he's managing director of and about his um, new book, uh, The Better Places Books, that are due to be launched next month. So um, Ben, do you just want to start off by introducing yourself? Yeah, cheers, Charlotte. So hello, everyone. My name is Ben Andrews. Uh, as Charlotte said, I'm managing director of Beyond Empower, which is a community interest company. And we help make mainstream provision more accessible for a range of different disabled people. I'm also author of Better Places picture book series, which I'll share a bit about later on. And um, I live in Salford, as you might be able to tell from this accent. I'm 30 years old. Okay, so Ben, um, you're visually impaired yourself. So can you tell me a little bit about your your condition, please? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's a key bit that I missed off. Um, so I've got a condition called retinitis pigmentosa that some people listening might be familiar with. Uh, and there's thousands of different variations of it, but basically it involves for everyone um, the deterioration in your eyesight. It's quite rapid. So usually people beyond the age of 40 have very little usable vision, although a lot of people lose it before then. And some people have a, might have a bit more vision beyond them, but that sense of the average. Um, for me, for now, it means that I have low levels of peripheral vision. So, um, you know, it, it does deteriorate to the point where it's just quite narrow tunnel vision. Apparently, I don't know because I'm not, I'm not at that stage yet. Um, I have trouble differentiating between colours. So I'll get stupid colours mixed up like navy, grey. I don't know. It just looks like a blur to me. Um, and the most significant thing is night blindness. So... Um, really poor vision in dull dark lighting, loads of fun in pubs and clubs anywhere that's not that well lit. Um, yeah, and I'd say that has the most significant impact for me at the minute. Okay, and um, your mum, has she got the same idea? Yeah, yeah, so it's an it's an hereditary condition. It's something that I've grown up with. So my mum had the condition, my granddad's still got the condition. Um, and yeah, so it's something I've grown up around. It's always been the norm in my family. Um, you know, it's never stopped any of us from doing anything in particular. My granddad travelled around the world. My mum was a social worker, went to uni, and, you know, we just sort of cracked on as a family with it, and it's always, um, yeah, been a norm for us. When you were younger, did you, uh, I don't always know exactly how, I know it's hereditary, but do you kind of know you're definitely going to have it, or is it one of those things that kind of reveals itself um, in later life? Is it kind of like a 50-50 chance of you inheriting the condition? Yeah, well, it was a like potentially passing it on to a kid was a big factor for my mum. So when she was first thinking about having kids, she went to doctors and consultants and she went to quite a few of them and just inquired, will I pass this condition on? Like a lot of parents, they, they, they get concerned about that. And they said it's a very low chance. It's like 90% chance that your child will not have the same condition as you. And now we know a lot more about RP. Um, the chances, you know, a lot slimmer than that. It's the likelihood is that your kid will have RP. It'll be passed on. Um, so yeah, she she had me under that understanding that I wouldn't have the condition. Um, and then she we got to about age. I think it wasn't until nursery that I was diagnosed actually because she, you know, it's hard to see at that stage. I was like I wasn't showing any symptoms or anything, uh, and then I couldn't see yellow and white in nursery. And um, then they took me to, I think it was Manchester Eye Hospital, and that's where they diagnosed me with RP. So I think it was pretty hard for my mum at the time. But, um, yeah, I'm glad I'm here at least. I'm not sure she is, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she wouldn't change it. So, yeah, I can completely understand that. We, You know, we speak to, um, you know, quite a lot of parents, and they go through that. It's not always necessarily with retinitis pigment. So it's like a range of conditions. There is that concern there but then you know once the children are here it's you know we wouldn't we wouldn't change it for the world and it you know I don't think I'm speaking just for myself as a parent um I wouldn't um magic wand my daughter back her vision so you know it, it's just one of those bridges that you cross when you get to it uh, but then you wouldn't have it any other way so but yeah. yeah that's it and I think it's I think it's one of them you know you never know what family you're going to be born into just because people might be disabled and might pass something on doesn't necessarily say that the kid's going to have a worse life than if they was born into a different family. So I think we put being disabled on this strange pedestal where it's like it's wrong to pass a certain condition down, but there's lots of kids born into families where they're not disabled in any way, shape or form and, you know, they don't have the best of life. So, 
yeah, I wouldn't say disability is something to put people off having kids. Do you think in terms of kind of, I, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about your companies and the work that you've done. Do you think in terms of that and, you know, and all that you've achieved in your your 30 years of life, do you think it, um, it was of a benefit that your mum and your and your grand your granddad was, uh, you know, had the same conditions? Do you think their depth of understanding of it and the fact that they've gone on to achieve great things that, you know, has impacted your life? Yeah, hundred and ten percent. I think that's the biggest factor uh, for lots of different ways. So, one from a parenting point of view, my mum from a very early age for both me and my brother. My brother's got perfect eyesight. She brought us up, um, you know, learning how to do cooking from an early age, how to do cleaning, how to do the washing because she knew that she was going to lose her sight, so she couldn't do that for us forever. So that that's give us really good transferable skills just in life generally. I've got mates who you know only just recently learned how to make their own bed. Um, because her mum had done everything for him for all her life. So it's, it, it sounds like a nice thing, but it's not necessarily giving the skills to get on independently. Um, and also, because I had a mum with the same condition, I couldn't get away with things. Um, in the, you know, So there was no excuses from my end. Or I, I, you know, I can't do this, mum. It was like, yeah, you can, because I've done it. You can go and do that for yourself sort of thing. And uh, sometimes, you know, some of the things that she allowed me to do probably gutted her and didn't make her that happy. So, for example, when I, was, when I was growing up, even though I had night blindness, I was out on the estate. I was, I was with my friends in, my da- in the dark. I was tripping up curbs. I was banging into posts, you know, banging into people that I shouldn't have been. Um, and I know that that would have really upset her, but she knew she had to give me that freedom to enable me to develop independence and get on in life on my own. So I'm really grateful for that. So, And I don't necessarily think that I would have had that if my mum hadn't had the condition. I can see her being, um, you know, as, as protective as she was and stuff, I can see her being quite, um, you know, wrapping me up sort of thing because I've got this condition and she felt like she needed to do everything if she didn't have that insight and experience herself. Yeah, no, completely. So, uh, well, let's move on now to some of the successes. So, um, I know you give us a little bit of a brief um, outline about Beyond Empower at the start, but can you just give us a bit more information about what you do? I know you don't just work exclusively with um, the visually impaired, so can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so a lot of it's led on from, um, you know, growing up with the condition, so coming across barriers, whether it be in streets, posts, signs, trees, put across pavements, and then when I was 17, I really started getting into the gym, and my mum actually started coming along with me, and um, we just seen how inaccessible the gym was for a near enough blind person. There was weights all over. Staff weren't quite sure what to do with you uh, in terms of, you know, guiding support or any type of support, really, even communicating, um, you know, that, how it goes. And people are looking over the shoulder at, at the partner or somebody else because they don't want to converse with a disabled person or a visually impaired person directly. Um, but we stuck it out in sort of the gym. And what we noticed is that over time, the culture of the gym started to change. Like people become a lot more aware of how to support my mum, how to interact with her. Weights were put out of the way before you was tripping over him. They'd bring out, um, you know, different machinery that was more audio or tactile. Um, So it really interested me how just us us being present in uh, leisure, a mainstream space alongside non-disabled people changed that culture there. It made it more inclusive, accessible place. So that really interested me. And I wanted to do that for more people. So um, a long, it was a long journey to this, but I set up a company, Beyond Empower. Uh, before that, I was doing volunteering. I, would, I went on to uni to study health sciences, but all trying to build a case for this company that I wanted to set up to help make mainstream uh, provision in leisure, activity, and life generally more accessible for disabled people. So um, that's set up now. We've got a small team of six. We operate across Greater Manchester. Um, We have services at the minute in Salford, Trafford and Tameside. And we work with groups of disabled people or individuals. So that might include visually impaired people. And we'll work with them to find out what they're interested in, in their locality, what they want to access and engage with. And then we'll go out into the community. We'll find that offer. Um, so if people are saying I want to go down to my local gym or I want to start a walking group or I want to go gardening we'll go out into the community we'll find those opportunities we'll work with the provider of the activity um, to make it more accessible so that might mean that we make standard gym programs a bit larger font or we turn them into audio files 
It might mean that we help local walk leaders map a more accessible walking route. And then once those changes have been made, we will support people uh, who've expressed an interest in them to access it. And we try and get people to the point where they're sustaining that activity independent of us, because that's what we want. We don't want, all right, as a company, we don't want people to be dependent on specialist services like ours to be able to access these type of things. We just want the community to be able to welcome them as they would any other customer. Uh, and we've had some really good successes. We've 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 got a group of blind people who um, expressed an interest in uh, chair yoga. So we went out into the community. We found a local chair yoga coach, uh, upskilled them. So the chair yoga was a bit more descriptive uh, for blind people to engage with because a lot of them had near enough no sight. And now they've been attending that for well over two years. It started during lockdown. It's self-sustaining. They're paying for it themselves and they, they really enjoy it and get a lot of value from that. So... Yeah, that's the company in a nutshell. But aside from that specific offer, we also work with infrastructure teams about how we can make streets more accessible, parks and green spaces more accessible to engage young people uh, who might be disabled. So, yeah, anything to make mainstream life more accessible for disabled people. So are you are you contacted by, like, local authorities or are you contact? Is it, like, is it a self-referral is it a self-referral thing? So say, for example, if I like my yeah. wanted to start accessing, would I get in touch with you myself and say, you know, I want some help making such and such more accessible for my daughter? Or would it be through the local authority? Would the local authority go, right, we know of this organisation that can help with this? How does it work, like the referral process? Yeah, so the referral process is anybody can access the services as long as we're in an area that we're commissioned in. So there's no cost to the person accessing our service so disabled people don't pay anything local community organizations don't pay anything the local authority will buy us in uh, which is the case in trafford so we're funded by the local authority in salford we funded through uh, nhs greater manchester and then in tameside we funded through a local leisure trust so it's different in each area but as long as we exist in that area people can refer themselves as long as they meet the criteria. They're 16 plus, they've got a GP in that area or reside in that area. And um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. And they consider themselves disabled according to the different criteria we've been set by our commissioners. All right, fabulous. Um, so yeah, let's move on to uh, your Better Places picture books, which are due to be launched on the 23rd of February. So in a few weeks time. Uh, yeah. So tell yeah, me more so about that. Yeah, so Better Places, again, has sort of come out of the work that we do uh, as, a, as a company. So they're not connected to the company, it's something I've set up. But over, over the years, working with adults around how we can make what they do work better for disabled people. And the most common thing that comes up is, I just never thought of that. When we're saying, put a sign there on the street instead of there, or let's convert a gym programme to audio and tactile rather than visual, uh, or let's make this park a different surface so people can differentiate between um, the footway and the um, sort of more playground type area so people can see tactics and Um so the most common thing that said is that I just never thought of these things and um, so better places is a way to try and help young children and um uh, and hopefully adults as well, if we can engage children and adults to think about some of these things early on. So as they grow and it's just part of who they are, how they operate, and, yeah, it works towards a more inclusive future to grow up in. Okay, so what actually happens in these? I know you've got your first one. Um, so what what give us, like, I know you don't want to give too much information because... <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, first <laughs> book, the first book's around... Um, uh, a young girl who's visually impaired. So it's Better Places Nikki and Candy Street. So the first series is all about street design. So Better Places Nikki and Stan Candy Street. The first part of it is looking at the barriers that blind and visually impaired people might face. Um, so it just exposes the, the reader to, these are some of the issues that we might take for granted or might not notice. These are some of the issues that blind and visually impaired people might face in street settings. And in the book, Nika is a young blind girl and she uses a white cane called Kanda. And Kanda's the person who's oh, the, the, the item, the object that swung into posts, bins, bags, um, trees, that sort of thing. So the reader sees that. And it, it, for me, it just took the sting out of it for a bit because 
obviously in, in everyday life that's some things that happen to children children are walking in those things because they're put in stupid places but you know that that's quite a hard um book for people to read it you know it's not very it's not very fun to read so the the cane experience and those barriers sort of takes the sting out of it a bit at least, at least that's that was the thinking behind it and then the, the middle part of the book is just um nicker having a good time a friend at a friend's house that's who she's on her way to visit and then the back end of the book is the reader's got the opportunity to make the street a better place um so it's about flicking things into the right place moving things around so it's an interactive book and it's just a way of making accessibility and access a bit more accessible and fun to children i think it can feel like quite a heavy daunting topic so even for adults so yeah it's just trying to put that across in a bit of a different way and the other side of it is showcasing young disabled people doing things independently you know nikki's getting around she's using a mobility aid she's going to visit a friend on her own and i wanted to get that message out there too uh, to try and encourage uh, independence for for young young people would your view that it would you know if the best case scenario would you like these books to be i don't know maybe part of the curriculum around disability awareness so it would be consumed in mainstream schools by people who don't have disabilities or young people and then that would help to change their thinking early on in life is that is that the yeah definitely so i think a lot of you know a lot of disabled children will be aware of these barriers so that it's definitely around how we can have the conversation with mainstream schools and main and um, children who access those those places to try and help them understand about the issues they might not be aware of. And then, as I say, they, they grow up more aware, uh, they know how to make environments more accessible and more inclusive, and that, that's the future that people are growing up into, so we're not facing the same barriers and issues that we're facing now. As well as the books, there's also wraparound learning resources and lesson plans so that teachers can teach a bit more wider, so the conversation doesn't just stop with the read of the book. It's about how can we learn about what blindness means in a really fun and accessible way. Um, how can we make our local places and spaces more accessible with some art activities and learn about geography and stuff like that. So there's stuff going on around the book to, to support the conversation beyond it. And then the other side of it for me, although we want mainstream um, schools to, to and the students who attend to start thinking about some of these things, there's subtle little things in the books as I said around you know, a, a young disabled girl getting around on her own, supporting that independence, using a mobility aid, which I know some kids struggle to to want to to want to do. So those type of things where it might be something that um a mainstream child would read and think, oh, these are barriers that I'm not aware of, but also a disabled child might read and think, oh, I can be independent like Nicker, or I can use a cane like Nicker, and to encourage that type of thinking as well. So um as we said before, the, the book is due out on the 23rd of February, um, but it's available for pre-order now. So how would people pre-order it if they were interested in it? Yeah, so, it, yeah, as you say, it's available for pre-order now and then people will expect it of the, of the week of the 23rd of February. Um, so for people to pre-order, they can go on to the publisher's website direct at Tiny Tree. If you just Google Tiny Tree in Better Places, Nikki and Candy Street, it'll pop up straight away. And if you want more information on the books and the resources around them you can visit betterplaces.uk that's the main website for the whole of the better places series and what format do the books come in is it, it, it some of them obviously because we might have some visually impaired children that are interested in reading the books um do you have it so there is it a lot electronic so it can work with things like screen readers and magnifiers and things like that yeah, so we've got a digital version. We will, we've obviously got the physical version in standard print. We can get large print um, books developed. We can get Braille versions. So um, whatever people you know need from the series, we can we'll work around and we'll make it as accessible as possible. And um, what's uh, who's next in your series? Have you have you have you wrote that bit yet? Yeah, yeah. So these five these five books in the first series all about street design. So the next um, book is Anthony and William Street. Um, and that's about a young guy who uses a wheelchair. So similar structure to Nikki and Candy Street in that it'll be a bit more, a bit of awareness of barriers. The middle section just showing, uh, you know, a young person having a bit of fun. And then the last bit is up to the reader to help make the street a better place. All right, fabulous. So um, coming towards the end of our interview now, and obviously you'll be <clears> on <throat> the, uh, 
speak to parents website so I always put people on their toes and ask them this last question so it if well, you know when you go on to be a parent or you know obviously the experiences you've had with your own mum what would be the best piece of advice that you would offer to a parent who is raising a visually impaired child yeah, I think it goes back to what I said at the start around just giving that independence and freedom um, to make mistakes, you know, to trip up, to fall down, to bang into things. These these things might sound stupid. Why would I let my kid do that? But I can honestly say that being allowed to do those things in quite vulnerable environments as a, as a young person has definitely helped with my resilience and perseverance as an adult. Um, so although it, it might feel... You know, it might go against your instincts to put your kid in those positions. Um, I think longer term it'll it'll serve them well. So that's I know I know that must be hard for for some parents, but yeah, that's that's what I try and encourage. Yeah, no, I completely echo that. I always say, you, you know, you've got to let them bang the head, otherwise they won't learn not to bang the head in. The <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's time. it. That's so, it. well, yeah, yeah, no, I I echo what you say, and um, you know, everything that you're doing sounds really impressive. I think you've worked really hard. I think both um Beyond Power and the new, you know, the new pitch book sound um fabulous. So, you know, keep on fighting the, the good fight. Um Thanks for joining me today. And we look forward to the release of the book. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers. All right, thanks very much. Bye bye.